So I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Um, today we are joined by Aaron Saylor, who is one of our staff attorneys at Columbia Riverkeeper. And Erin has quickly developed a reputation for her sharp attention to detail and very impressive sleuthing skills. Erin um, graduated from Lewis and Clark Law School with her certificate in environment and natural resources law. And after law school, Erin worked in DC for six years at the US Environmental Protection Agency, first working in the Office of Water and then as a civil, civil enforcement attorney um, and uh, she is most proud of her work there um, in developing a nationally consistent enforcement program for lead paint violations. And after some, taking some time off for family, Aaron, we were lucky to have Erin join Columbia Riverkeeper in 2019, where she focuses primarily on protecting the Columbia from frack gas, oil by rail, and other fossil fuel infrastructures. Um, our second panelist is Dan Sears. Um, Dan is Columbia Riverkeepers Conservation D Director and has been a major contributor to our regional fight against fossil fuels and an all-around powerhouse for Riverkeeper. Uh, Dan's background is in Earth Sciences, Earth Science Systems, or sorry, Earth System Science, and he received a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science at Stanford University. In um, 20 2005, Dan joined Columbia Riverkeeper as one of the lead organizers in our successful campaigns to protect the Columbia River estuary um, forests and farmland from Bradford Landing and Oregon LNG proposals and their related pipelines. And um, in 2000, since 2009, Dan has fulfilled the role of conservation director, where his work continues um, to protect the Columbia River from a barrage of fossil fuel export proposals, including LNG terminals, coal export terminals, oil by rail facilities, and power plants. And that's just um, some of the stuff that these fine folks do. And I am going to be the moderator, moderator for tonight. I'm Kate Murphy. Um, I'm a community organizer with Columbia River, and I have the privilege of working with folks like Aaron and Dan and lots of folks who are on this call. Um, and I received a master's of public health uh, with a focus on environmental systems and human health from Oregon Health and Sciences University. And I work a lot um, with communities along the river to support members um, in their fights to, to stop these harmful f developments from happening along the Columbia River. And a lot of my work is focused on fossil fuels. I also do some work um, saving salmon through stopping pollution and um, working to push for removal of the lower Snake River dams. So our, with that, we will get started. Um, and I wanna just start by showing you all um, one of my very favorite images to reference. And it's an image that many of you will have seen before. And Gabby, if you wanna advance to the next slide. So this is a map of all of the fossil fuel projects in this region that's often called, you know, part of the thin green line. And these fossil fuel projects, this map is so great because the big red X's really kind of illustrate the, the power and success that this region has had over the last couple of decades, really fighting back these massive fossil fuel infrastructure projects. And if you look closely at this map, what you'll notice is that there are three projects that, that don't have X on them, those red X's that are so beautiful to see. So um, when you look at that, you'll see that those three projects are three of the three of some of the projects that we're going to be discussing tonight and projects that we are actively involved in in fighting. And, and so we'll be discussing those and hopefully we'll pretty soon we'll be able to update this map with just all red X's. So the night the idea for tonight's webinar is that we're really going to just kind of move down river. Um, through the, the projects that we're working on in our fossil fuel program area. Because if anybody's like me, everybody's kind of like got bits and pieces of all these different projects and we just wanted to be able to give a, a, an opportunity to folks to have a just one-stop shopping opportunity to get updates on all of these projects. So we will be having a question and answer session at the end. Um, so folks will be able to enter their questions in the chat or folks who are watching on Facebook Live can enter them there and we will try to get to as many questions as we can, but you can also follow up with us at ColumbiaRiverkeeper.org. Um, and with that, thank you again to everyone for being here tonight. Um, we're gonna be throwing a lot of information at you, so um, hang in there and um, we're gonna get started with Perennial Wind Chaser and I'm gonna pass to Erin 
to talk more about perennial. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for those great introductions. Um, oh, this is just one more introduction slide that we have here to discuss the, um, all the projects that we're going to run through in more detail later on tonight. Uh, Gabby, could you go to the next slide? So we're going to start tonight by talking about the perennial wind chaser station project. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this project, it's a 415 megawatt proposed fracked gas power plant, which would be constructed directly across the street from the existing Hermiston generating station power plant out in Umatilla County. Um, it's proposed to be a peaker plant, which basically means that it will provide energy when the normal energy facility is not producing enough to meet demand. So if you look at its greenwash name, perennial wind chaser, um, they've really touted this project as being um, a power plant that would provide power when the wind facilities out in the gorge are not producing enough energy to meet demand. Um, one of the issues with peaker plants, however, is even though they're smaller facilities, they start up and shut down frequently. And so that tends to generate a lot of extra air pollution. So if this facility is eventually constructed, it would be one of the largest greenhouse gas emitters in the state of Oregon. Um, it was first proposed back in about 2014, 2015. It received its site certificate from the Energy Facility Siting Council um, initially back in 2015. So for those of you who are not familiar with the ins and, out of, ins and outs of energy siting in the state of Oregon, the Energy Facility Siting Council is basically it's an independent body made up of folks that the governor appoints. Um, they sit on this council um, and make decisions about energy siting. They're under the umbrella of the Oregon Department of Energy, and so they are supported by staff from the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, so because, so I don't trip over my words too much tonight, I'm gonna call the Energy Facility Siting Council is typically shortened to FSEC, and the Oregon Department of Energy is typically shortened to ODO. So that's what I'm talking about when I throw out those acronyms there. Um, now, the site certificate that they received back in 2015, basically a site certificate is a roadmap for how an energy facility will be constructed and operated. Um, it's also a binding contract between FSEC and the energy facility. So any changes that are made with regard to how the facility is going to be constructed or operated need to be done through an amendment process with FSEC or the council. Um, so perennial, um, this initial site certificate that they had, they amended it once to push back their construction deadlines. So their final construction deadline was September 23rd, 2020. Now here's where things get really interesting. Back in April of last year, a number of companies came to FSEC and requested blanket extensions for their construction deadlines because of COVID related delays. Um, FSEC declined to do that and suggested instead that the companies would need to apply for site certificate amendments. So this is what typ it typically happens. And it's not at all uncommon for energy facilities to not be running behind in their construction deadlines. But all they need to do is apply for a site certificate amendment with FSEC and typically they're granted their extension. Um, now Perennial had an incentive not to do this because what happens is when you amend the site certificate to change the construction deadlines at that time FSEC has to look at whether there have been any changes in law or fact since the last time the site certificate was amended well here over the summer FSEC adopted new carbon offset rates um, so if F if perennial had sought a site certificate amendment they would have had to revise the carbon offset rates in their site certificate, which likely would have cost them somewhere in the area of about $11 million. So they had an incentive not to want to reopen their site certificate. So as the summer progressed, we reached out to FSEC staff to ODO um, in August to see if Perennial had in fact applied for a site certificate amendment. And we were surprised to learn that no, they hadn't because they were expected to start construction by their September 23rd deadline. 
Now, we're, this seemed pretty fishy to us because we knew that they still don't have a power purchaser yet. They're also, their initial air permit has expired. So it was kind of shocking that they were on track to start construction by the end of September. So we filed a bunch of records requests. We requested explanations from Odo staff. Um, we ultimately learned from Odo staff that they had unilaterally, without seeking approval from council, devised the plan to break perennials construction into phases. So phase one was gonna be the construction of a road and access bridge, um, which we've been calling the road to nowhere because nowhere in any of these records have we seen any plan for construction of any other part of the facility. It's just phase one, which is this road and this access bridge. Um, so um, let me remind you again, if we go back to the site certificate and how I said earlier that it's a binding contract between FSEC, not ODO, between FSEC and the energy facility. So when ODO went through um, and decided to come up with this phased construction plan, that's not in their site certificate. That's something that ODO came up with all on their own. What is in their site certificate is a um, list of conditions that need to be met before construction can begin. And they don't go through and they don't say, this is a condition for phase one, this is a condition for phase two. They're just, these are conditions that have to be met before construction, period. Well, again, what Odo did unilaterally was go in and decide, okay, well, this condition's phase one, this one can wait until later. Um, you know, it went through all, through all the conditions in the site certificate to do that. And again, they did this without council approval. Now to us, this looked very much like they were amending the site certificate on their own without seeking FSEC approval um, and kind of behind the closed doors without any sort of public input or involvement. And this was a huge red flag for us. So we raised a huge fuss about it. We raised it with FSEC staff, with council, with the director of the Department of Energy. We brought it to the governor's office. Uh, and thank you all to all of you who are listening tonight who helped us with that outreach, outreach through our action alerts or made calls to the governor's office. Um, you may have also seen that the Oregonian picked up the story um, and wrote a couple different articles highlighting Odo's actions. Unfortunately, it was all to no avail. So on September 24th, we reached out again right after their construction deadline passed. Um, we reached out to Odo staff to inquire as to what the status was and they told us that perennial had officially started construction so what did we do we sued <laughs> we partnered with friends of the columbia gorge and we filed a petition for judicial review against the oregon department of energy in state court so we're in the very early stages of that case right now um, but we'll keep you all updated as we move through that process um, and another interesting twist <laughs> One of the construction uh, requirements, pre-construction requirements that somehow got lost in the mix when Odo was deciding which applied and which didn't was the requirement that Perennial obtain a construction stormwater permit before it starts any work at the site. So this was not just a condition of their site certificate, it's a requirement under the Clean Water Act and it's a requirement under Oregon law. Um, so what did we do? We sued. <laughs> we sued Perennial directly in federal court for these Clean Water Act violations. Um, and if you look at the picture that we have up here on the slide, this is a picture that Dan took. He's been driving out there pretty frequently to take pictures um, to figure out what's been going on at the site. Um, so this is their road to nowhere. Um, we understand that Perennial has since stopped construction since they learned that we were going to file the lawsuit. Um, a DEQ has levied a fine against them. Um, but the thing about a construction stormwater violation is once they've disturbed the area and until they have a permit, every time it rains is another Clean Water Act violation. So even though DEQ has already levied this fine, we are moving forward with our lawsuit against Perennial. Um, to get them to kind of clean up their act and follow the law out there. 
So we're still in the very early stages of both lawsuits. Again, you know, we'll keep everybody updated as we move along through those. Um, in terms of how to engage in next steps, um, hopefully there'll be some future decision points with FSEC and Odo. It's definitely if folks are interested in reaching out to their legislators or the governor's office, um, just to um, put some pressure on them to really follow up and see what Odo's been up to with all these unilateral decisions happening behind f back. That would be super helpful. Um, you know, it's interesting to note too that Perennial isn't the only facility that they've been doing these kind of backdoor amendments, site certificate amendments with. Um, so it really is a pervasive problem at Odo right now. And um, we also expect at some point uh, they're initial air permit that they received since it's been so long since they received it and they haven't started construction yet that's expired so we do expect them to be applying for a new air permit sometime here soon um, and that will be put out for public comments to engage in that process as well so i know that's a lot that i just threw out at everyone dan and kate do you have anything else to add Thank you so much, Erin. I mean, one of the things that really sticks out as you describe this is this kind of, you know, egregious thing that's going on. We have Governor Brown put these new regulations in place specifically for projects like this so that they would have to pay for their pollution. And they're trying to skirt around these regulations by building this road to nowhere. And then they build this road to nowhere in violation of a stormwater permit. And it's, it's just is, is really hard to believe that that this is going on so thank you so much for your work on this and for explaining that to folks because this is kind of you know one of those projects that people don't see it all the time like some of the others and so um it's and dan as well for being vigilant on tracking this project you know it's it's really important that we help folks know what's going on when when other people think we're not looking so yeah and anything from you dan that you wanted to to add on perennial no, it's just a, it's a good reason to stop in a really beautiful part of the Plumbing River. It doesn't look very pretty in this particular, you know, road picture here, but, you know, this is a really beautiful sweep of the Plumbing River um, near the McNary Dam. So, uh, an area that also suffers from often poor air quality and inversions in the winter. So the VOC pollution that would come from this plant would directly impact folks. Thank you. And um, we saw very quickly at the beginning of um, the presentation, a, a picture of the five projects we're working down river to. So we're gonna move a little further down river um, for perennial wind chaser. Um, I just have to say, when I say perennial wind chaser, I hear that name and it's like the greenwashing is so strong there. Um, the ramping up and ramping down, ch kind of chasing the wind. I just uh, can't can't get over that. Um, but we're going to move a little bit downstream to Arlington and talk about one of fracked gas, you know, not uh, dirty dirty secrets, um, which is radioactive fracking waste. And so I'm going to pass to Dan to fill us in on what's going on in Arlington. Yeah, I'm going to start by just explaining what this is. Um, so during the fracking process you know, to extract oil and gas from the ground and to fracture rock and release those uh, hydrocarbons. Um, they force these uh, large volumes of um, drilling fluids and other chemicals into the ground. And when they go in, they will gather and dissolve into um, basically, you know, mix with radioactive material that's naturally occurring. And when this stuff comes back up to the surface um, in drilling fluid, it will have concentrated it sometimes, or at least uh, brought up to the surface this radioactive material. And um, so this is an interesting and not well known uh, impact of fracking, that it actually creates a very significant radioactive waste stream. Um, with contaminants like uh, radium and thus creating radon and uranium, thorium, other radionuclides. Um, so what has happened is this is a very expensive problem to address. And the image you see here 
is um, from a report. It's on the, the cover of a report from the Western Organization of Resource Councils. It's a really good report. It's linked there um, that looks at this issue. And those are filter socks. And what those are, you know, as they bring these drilling fluids for hydraulic fracturing, um, as those fluids come back to the surface, they filter some of the stuff out, the solids, and so they can re-inject the fluid. And those socks will basically concentrate um, and technologically enhance as, um, the radioactive material. So industry folks call this TNOR, technologically enhanced, naturally occurring radioactive material. Um, we don't think there's anything normal about this, so we're just gonna go ahead and call it radioactive fracking waste, uh, which we think is much more descriptive and helpful for people to understand. Um, so one of the concerning aspects of this is that it takes many different shapes. Uh, it could be fluid, it could be solid. So in this case, um, you have filter socks in this image, um, which look a lot, an awful lot like little fishing nets. Uh, and this has been a concern for people where they've seen these discarded in um, rural communities along uh, where, they're, where they're just dumped conveniently. Um, again, this is an expensive waste stream to, to deal with. And so to make the whole fracking process more, well, cheaper, um, they kind of hide this expense by dumping these materials in communities that are unsuspecting. This brings us to Arlington, Oregon, uh, which received 2.5 million pounds of radioactive fracking waste over a three year period. The Oregon Department of Energy um, brought this forward as a problem in 2020. They learned of it in late 2019. They were alerted of this issue by a fracking activist in uh, North Dakota, according to ODOE. Um, so it was someone like one of you um, out there, you know, someone who cares a lot about the, uh, the future of their community and the health of their community who did a huge service to Oregon and alerted us um, to a big problem here. And Oregon Department of Energy uh, quickly you know, asked and, and began investigating whether uh, chemical waste management had in fact accepted these 2.5 million pounds of radioactive waste and whether it was radioactive enough, polluted enough to qualify as radioactive waste for Oregon standards. And in fact, it did. Um, so 2.5 million pounds of this stuff came into Oregon. Um, most of that was these filter socks, which you see on the screen. Um, and as a result, uh, we saw some of the heavier radionuclides um, ending up in the dump at Arlington. So over a three year period, they dumped this material in, brought in by rail and some by truck. Um, all of this, again, a product of fracking. Uh, in this case, probably for oil, but the same thing occurs for gas, for, for fracked gas. And so for, for both the stand up to oil campaign and the fracked gas campaign, um, we want to acknowledge that there are upstream communities, uh, very often people in rural communities and tribal communities who deal with these radioactive fracking waste streams. And you know, our experience with it is really a small snippet. But it if that's the case, you know, if it's a small snippet of the bigger picture, it's pretty alarming. because uh, here's what happens. Um, you know, they dump this stuff in Arlington over a three year period and then they put all kinds of other waste into it. Um, in the end, you know, they expected to see not very much radioactivity in the leachate, in the water that collects at the bottom of the, of the dump. But what in fact they saw was uh, 358 picocuries per liter. That number doesn't mean a lot to most folks. So I'll just bring it down. Uh, that's quite a bit. That's more than 10 times above the drinking water standard. So I'll just summarize it that way and say, this is a significant amount of uranium, uh, U-238. 
And so having that amount of uranium concentrating in the water that kind of percolates down and gathers in the base of that landfill um, is problematic. And it shows that this whole fracking waste stream can have a real impact on you know, this dump, but ultimately, you know, uranium-238 has a very, very, very long half-life. And so you're gonna see, um, you know, and it's, you're gonna see a durable impact to this area from, from this concentration of this waste here. Um, the real concern in, in Arlington is they actually take that water and they pump it to the surface and they spray it around the top to suppress the dust that's on the landfill. That's a questionable approach, um, in our opinion, to managing the waste going forward. And so the next steps for this process are, are two things, really. One, the Oregon Department of Energy is developing stronger rules to make sure this never happens again. And we appreciate the work that they've done so far. We think that this has been a, um, a good faith effort to try to tighten up these loopholes and make sure that Oregon does become targeted. Um, but really there, there needs to be a, a larger reckoning with this industry and this waste stream um, because there's communities all over North America who are being hit by this. And then secondly, um, there's the question of Arlington and how that community and the communities around it, including the tribal communities, uh, will be impacted. Um, so uh, it's really significant that, you know, from our perspective that, you know, the leachate within the landfill currently um, is elevated in its radioactivity. You know, I went to, I just want to say a word about the people in Arlington um, who asked very, very tough questions in a public meeting in the spring when chemical waste management got caught doing this, accepting this waste. You know, they've paid a fine now of $60,000, which is just a few cents per uh, pound of radioactive material they accepted. And a lot of folks in Arlington really questioned whether they were going to be held accountable. And they asked questions about the water, about this leachate. And they just went straight for that issue. Um, and I, I thought that it was important impressive to see a community which you know from what I saw I did didn't want to have the stigma of uh, being a radioactive dump and so it's a tricky thing you know they don't deserve to have this to be a dumping ground um, at the same time you have to look at it clearly and understand how much damage has been done and this is what the fracking industry is doing throughout the United States and this is a real concern at the, at the local level, not even considering what's happening in the climate. Um, so it's both these things at the same time. And so in the case of Arlington, you know, the, the company Chemical Waste Management said they didn't expect to see any of the radioactivity entering into the leachate because what they had dumped was mostly filter socks. And so it would hold the radioactivity in place. And within, you know, by May of 2020, that was demonstrably false. And they had already seen 358 picocuries per liter breaking into the leachate. So that to us is kind of a motivating factor for why we should keep watching this radioactive fracking waste problem. And we will through 2020, we encourage everyone, or 2021, and uh, we encourage everyone here too as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. I know this is um, an issue that you know, a lot of f folks weren't even familiar with before the Arlington news hit. I, and, um, you know, it's not super common knowledge that fracking waste can be radioactive waste. And one of the big issues is it's regulated differently state by state and regulations tend to be quite poor. In some states, they even use this fracking waste, which the industry likes to call produced water. It's got such a high sodium content, they use it as, as, as de-icer on the roads and just dump it straight on the roads to melt the ice. So it's super important that we um, really force our state to push for protective measures because it sounds like 
you know, we got lucky because we heard about this, but this is a situation where there's this really highly toxic waste that's being taken and dumped for over the per a period of time at a, at a dump that's not equipped to handle that type of waste. And then we finally hear about it. And it's a, it, it's a serious public health and environmental concern that could last for decades. So we really want to make sure that we push our states to have protective um, rules and, and regulations around this. And I, I know a lot of times with this type of waste, they, you know, will sometimes look to just reclassify the type of waste instead of actually handling it properly. And we don't want them to do that. We want them to recognize it for how, how toxic and dangerous it is. Um, so thank you for explaining that to us, Dan. Um, Aaron, any thoughts on that or should we keep heading downstream? No, I would just piggyback on everything that you said just now. Um, you know, the states are basically playing hot potato with this waste. You know, nobody wants it in their landfill. So it's just getting, the companies are starting to get more and more creative. Well, what state can we send it to now? Um, so it's super important that Oregon adopt um, more stringent laws to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future. And then I also was fortunate to be on the rulemaking advisory committee for um, the enforcement regulation. So initially, um, you know, chem waste has been fined by both the Oregon Department of Energy and DEQ at this point. Um, but initially, Odo's fine was very, very, very shockingly, horrifyingly low. And it was largely because their enforcement authorities, the regs that tell them how to calculate their penalties, um, just didn't really account for this kind of situation. So um, they are in the process of updating those. So hopefully if this does happen again, there will be less of a financial incentive for chem waste or another facility like it to just you know, accept the waste and hope nobody figures it out. One thing I want to add too is, you know, some of the folks who spoke in Arlington when I was out there, um, you know, worked, I think, at the chemical waste management facility. And it takes a lot of courage to speak when you live in a community where most people are employed at a facility like that. And so I just want to acknowledge that it's a complicated thing um, for people to address this um, in their own community. And I think it, uh, I think it's good to have strong rules at the state level uh, to make sure that folks don't have to carry all that weight on their own. So. Thank you. So with that, we're gonna continue downstream to a project that many of us who happen to be located in Portland are very familiar with, um, Zenith Energy. Um, and I'm gonna pass to Aaron to talk to us more about this project and some of the pretty exciting developments that have happened recently with, with our fight with, um, you know, harmful pollutants. Yeah, so uh, Zenith or Zenith Energy Terminal Holdings is an oil by rail facility located in the Northwest industrial section of Portland. Um, it had historically been an asphalt refinery, this particular location. Uh, Zenith purchased it at the end of 2018 and has really been looking for ways to expand its oil unloading capacity ever since. Um, what we're seeing from Zenith, and Gabby, if you want to go to the next slide for a second, I think it's the next one. Um, the Oregonian put together this great map showing um, the likely route that the oil is coming in through the city. Um, from what we've observed, and you, you can generally figure out what type of oil they're handling based on the placards on the side of the tanks. And so Dan and Kate and other activists have been tracking that it's most likely coming both from Canada, but also Bakken crude from North Dakota. Um, and it comes down through the gorge, um, right along the river, over bridges that go over various tributaries and waterways, straight through Vancouver, straight through the city of Portland. Um, so it's a really serious risk um, having these oil trains running through these areas. We saw the Mosier train derailment in 2016. We saw the uh, Custer train derailment up in Northern Washington just a few weeks ago. Um, with the Custer train derailment, we were incredibly lucky that it, A, that it happened in a fairly sparsely populated area, but also that train was only moving seven miles per hour. Um, these trains that are coming down the gorge are moving much, much faster than that. I think Dan said 50 miles per hour or so. 
Um, so if one of these trains were to derail when it's going that fast, either through the gorge or through the city, there's a significant risk of a catastrophic accident happening. So we do not want this in the city. Um, and we have been um, trying to make sure that Zenith doesn't expand and ideally phases out its handling of crude. Um, in 2019, they fought or they sought permits from the city to build new pipes under Northwest Front Avenue. What they're doing now is the trains come into their facility, they unload them on rail racks uh, on their facility, and then they pipe them under the road under Northwest Front Avenue over to Chevron's dock. Um, and then they, they end up on tanker ships and then they go out to the river and usually end up either up in a Washington refinery or down in California at a refinery. So um, what they sought to do in 2019 was, oh Gabby, can you go back two slides? One more. There we go. Um, so what they sought to do in 2019 was build um, some additional pipes under Northwest Front Avenue to that Chevron dock. Um, in order to do this, they would have had to have uh, getting a gotten a revision to their franchise agreement with the city. Um, I don't want to get super wonky, but basically a franchise agreement is um, a permit to build under city roads. So the city denied that agreement um, or that revision based on the fact that the city has a number of policies and ordinances in place to prohibit the expansion of existing fossil fuel terminals. So Zenith has been claiming that these new pipes would have been for biofuels, uh, but the city's concern and our concern too is that once they're constructed, there's no way to know or ensure that they wouldn't ever be used for fossil fuels. Um, in fact, in one of Zenith's recent permit applications, they admitted as much. You know, they said that this is for biofuels, but once it's constructed, it will become a part of our fossil fuel distribution facility. Um, so, um, after the city denied that plan to build those new pipes under the road, Zena threatened to sue the city. Um, we waited for a while to see if that would happen. Instead, they decided to abandon that project, and now they are proposing to build a new rail, uh, a loading rack on its own footprint of its facility. So I think that they were probably hoping that they'd have an easier time getting city permits if they weren't trying to go under a road. Um, so that's where they are now. They haven't yet finished their getting their building permits from the city, um, nor have they gotten their construction stormwater permit or their air permit from the Department of Environmental Quality. So um, since they don't have any of those permits, they can't start construction yet. However, we um, know from driving by that starting last spring, um, we'd seen that Zenith had been moving quite a bit of dirt around. Uh, they'd taken down a number of trees, they graded the site, they made some pretty sizable debris and dirt piles. Um, and so we looked into, well, how can, this, how can this be? Because we know that they've applied for their construction stormwater permit with the Department of Environmental Quality, but DEQ came back and told them that they couldn't process that permit until Zenith got a new land use compatibility statement from the city of Portland. So once again, the city of Portland is in the driver's seat here, deciding whether or not this expansion plan meets the city's goals and land use goals and uh, policies. So uh, Zenith applied for that land use compatibility statement or LUX, um, but hasn't received it yet. The city asked Zenith to come back and answer a bunch of questions about their application. Um, that information is due back in mid-February, but they haven't sent that back in yet. So we know they don't have the LUX, which means we know they don't have the stormwater construction permit. So why are they moving all this dirt around? <laughs> so like Perennial, um, we teamed up with Willamette Riverkeeper, and earlier this week, we sent a notice of intent to sue under the Clean Water Act to Zenith, um, basically telling them that we've observed these, what appear to be pretty significant Clean Water Act violations on their property for starting construction without this permit. Um, so that's very, very early in the process. Basically, a notice of intent to sue 
under the Clean Water Act, you have to notify um, the company first um, for 60 days. They have 60 days to try to correct it, and then we can file our formal uh, complaint in federal court. So we're in that 60 day period right now. We just sent the NOI out on Monday. Um, you may have seen we've already gotten some press on it. OPB has picked it up, Portland Tribune. Um, so if you wanna read more about it, we can send you those news links. Um, but in addition to the construction stormwater permit, Zenith also has an outstanding application to DEQ for an air permit. So the company is currently operating under an air permit that was originally issued to Paramount Petroleum Company, which was two owners ago, um, when the facility was still being used as an asphalt refinery. So that permit's been expired for about nine years now. Um, a prior owner applied for a new permit and under DEQ regulations, if you apply for a permit, um, you can basically operate under your existing permit until DEQ has a chance to process the new one. So Zenith has been operating under this expired permit for, you know, since 2012. Well, the permit has been expired since 2012. Zenith has been operating under it for the entire extent of the time that they've owned the property. Um, so like the construction stormwater permit, DEQ told them that they couldn't process this air permit any further until they get a new land use compatibility statement from the city of Portland. So once again, Portland's in the driver's seat here. Um, to ensure that um, Zenith's total operation, as well as the expansion plan, fits with the city's land use goals. So how to engage in the future? Um, we expect that at some point here, the city will make a decision on the Lux. Um, we've heard from um, the city permit reviewers that they typically do not put Lux out for public comment but because this one has so much um, public interest and because of the you know, seriousness of it, that this one likely will be put out for public comment. So we'll let everyone know when that happens. Um, and then eventually the DEQ will also put the air permit and the stormwater permit out for public comment as well. So um, for right now, you know, if you could, you could help by keeping a close eye on the train traffic that's coming through, um, trying to figure out what types of oil that they're handling. Um, and also, you know, reach out to city council and let them know what a bad, you, we've got a number of new city council members now um, and they may not be as familiar with Zenith as some of the existing counselors had been. So just reach out to them and let them know, keep an eye on this company. Don't just rubber stamp their permits. Um, yeah, Dan and Kate, do you have anything else to add? Thank you, Erin, for your work on this and, and you know, to Willamette Riverkeeper and to so many of the community activists and coalition partners who've been working on Zenith for many years. And it's so difficult. You know, we have these projects that we're trying to stop from, from starting, but then we also are looking at pro harmful projects that are already in operation and it's a little bit different dynamic and it feels a little bit harder sometimes to stop the boulder from rolling down the hill. So um, just huge kudos to everyone who has really brought attention to this project over the years. And, and you know, this is how we can, can get movement and can make these things happen. It's really exciting to see that we can really try to hold them accountable um, for how they're affecting our communities and our environment. So I think, you know, this is another also highlights the importance of keeping our eye our eyes peeled for these types of operations that are really kind of a bait and switch, right? Because this was an asphalt facility to begin with when they first started shipping, you know, these harmful materials through Portland and other sensitive areas, there was no public input. There was no, you know, public knowledge of it really until people kind of uncovered what was happening. And so um, this is a great, great piece of news for, for so many folks who have really been fighting to improve the, you know, the air shed in this area and the water quality and everything like that. So um, it's really, really exciting. And, you know, the fact that they're operating on this very old, old, old permit and they've completely changed the nature of their operations is just pretty outrageous. So it's great that we can make a little bit of progress there. 
Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add on about Zenith? Uh, just a reflection that um, there's been so much hard work through the years on these neighboring oil train terminals that informed this work on Zenith. And uh, a lot of that was done by the tribal nations of the Columbia River who identified just the outrageous risk of these trains hurtling through communities and fishing sites going 50 miles an hour. Um, so that's really kind of one of the central themes here. And um, just want to acknowledge that, you know, many people who are listening to this, you may live within range of an oil train route and, um, or an LPG train route or some other high hazard train. And this is something that we as communities will continue to need to identify and work together to address. And very often those risks fall on um, disproportionately on communities of color and uh, BIPOC communities. And that's actually represented really well if you look at the um, Washington Environmental Health Disparities Map, which is a really remarkable tool. Um, we, should, we should link sometime later. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so we are going to continue moving down river. Um, and the next project that we're going to talk about is the Kalama Methanol Refinery. This project has a ton of history to it, much more than I could ever try to cover in 10 minutes. So I'm going to try and give a broad overview of, of kind of what's relevant with this project right now, where we are now. And, and um, just keep in mind, if you want to dig into this project more, we have a ton of resources at ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org and under our methanol pages. And um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of information there. Um, so this methanol refinery is the, the world's largest fracked gas to methanol refinery that they're trying to put in Kalama, Washington, which is just a small town of around 2,700 people. And so this company called Northwest Innovation Works, they, they had in mind doing kind of like twin projects, these twin kind of methanol refineries and the twin would have ended up downstream in Port West, which Dan is gonna talk about in a little bit, but um, the Kalama projects moving, has moved a lot faster. And so we've been really focused on working with the Kalama folks and um, larger partner groups to, to really try to protect this area from this project. So this large refinery would basically bring in fracked gas. Now we know there's like a ton of issues with the health impacts and environmental impacts of frack gas. So we know fracking is bad. It would utilize frack gas and convert it to methanol and then it would export it to um, Asia. And initially Northwest Innovation Works had, had said, oh, we're gonna use all of this uh, methanol to replace or to, to be used to make plastics and it's going to replace dirtier ways of making plastics. Um, but in fact, we, you know, it came to light that they were promoting it being used as fuel, liquid sunshine to their investors. So um, this is just not, you know, if the best thing you can say about your project is that it's going to make more plastic, that's, it's, a, it's kind of a non-starter there. But this is just a really a climate busting project for both, you know, Washington and the region for the goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, it, it, it's not something that we want in our communities, but it's not something we want for the larger environment. So that so the single refinery could consume 320 million cubic feet of frack gas per day. Um, so it's a massive stream of frack gas. It's more than all of the under, other industrial uses in Washington. Um, and it would be emitting a, a massive amount of greenhouse gas emissions as well, which would just blow through our clim climate goals. Initially, Inslee had Kind of supported this project as he learned more about it. Um, I think it was in May of, of, I think it was in May. Yeah, he he came out in opposition to ultimately to this project, seeing it for what it was. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of greenwashing going on on the other side of this project. In fact, so far as to you know kind of adopt some of our language and say like we're really fighting climate change and we're working really hard for the environment. And it's it's really you know they're trying to package it in a way so that it looks good for the environment. But in, in what we see, what we know for sure is that the the amount of emissions that it would produce are just, you know, not something that we can afford. The risks of this project are just way too great. Um, so there's been a lot of different processes going on um, on the state level. They've been working on the final, the environmental impact statement for this project for a long time. And um, there's been a lot of back and forth um, initially 
there was an EIS, an environmental impact statement submitted. Um, it was challenged. Uh, we CRK, Columbia Riverkeeper was one of the um, people who challenged that um, in court saying that it should be more thorough and should include more environmental emissions impacts. Um, so Department of Ecology requested supplemental information. We call that the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement or the SEIS. Um, there was, I'm trying to make a long story short here because there's been a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of, you know, requests for additional information. Ultimately, they, Ecology was not receiving the information from the Port of Kalama, Cowlitz County, and, and the company involved Northwest Innovation Works. Um, and so they decided to kind of take over that supplemental process um, and do it themselves. And so they just recently, in October, released the final secondary supplemental environmental impact statement for this project. And that's the document that they're going to use to inform their shorelines permit. So that's the last big state permit that they need for this project. And that's the permit that ecology is focused on. So that's why we're putting a lot of pressure on the Department of Ecology and on Governor Inslee to stop this, to deny this permit at the state level. And we are expecting that decision really any day between now and January 20th. So they're gonna be making the decision on the shorelines permit, which is a state permit, by the 20th, the 20th of this month. And during that process, when we were you know, having the public hearings um, for all of this, like back when we were meeting in person, when we, before COVID, it, there was you know, a thousand, more than a thousand people turned out at the public hearing in person. And then we had these virtual hearings in September where we had like a, you know roughly 12 hours of testimony in the midst of this global pandemic and these really raging wildfires that was the month of all the smoke and everything and we had so many people show up and give testimony and you know more than two you know there, there was a huge number in opposition it was like roughly five out of seven of those giving testimony were opposed to this project and then additionally like the, there was massive amounts of comments that were submitted to the department of ecology about this project and you know back of the envelope calculation we you know i heard 90 to 95 percent of those comments were in input in opposition to the project so there's just massive public opposition um and and when that that final document came out there was just some like minor tweaks but really those tweaks were the direct result of this huge community engagement that happened and community, you know, citizen scientists and research and all this stuff that got poured into this campaign and really informed the state agency so much so that they say adjusted some of their language. And, and we really feel like that is, um, you know, a huge testament to the, this community's uh, dedication to protecting what we love. And we feel really impressed by that. Um, and so thank you to all of you who've been involved in that. So while all this shorelines, you know, state permit stuff's been going on, in the meantime, you may have heard about a lawsuit that got filed. Now this is on the federal level. So there's a, the Army Corps of Engineers was responsible for assessing this project and assessing its environmental impact statement. So um, we filed a lawsuit, Columbia Riverkeeper in partnership with Sierra Club, Washington Environmental Council, Center for Biological Diversity, and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, we were represented by Earth Justice and we filed a lawsuit where we uh, said that, you know, the Army car needs to do a thorough EIS on this project and needs to include the full upstream, downstream pipeline, all of the, you know, emissions impacts that this project would actually have and we got a preliminary we got a, a a ruling in this case which was really exciting so this is a federal court case we have the shorelines permit which is state and then we have this federal court case with the army corps and the court ruled but basically what they did they vacated northwest innovation works federal permits for construction of this terminal so they uh, none of their federal construction permits are valid right now because of this court court case they ruled that the core had had failed to consider the need for the pipeline so there's the, an associated pipeline with this project called the it's a three mile pipeline called the kalama lateral pipeline which would be basically connect the main pipeline to the refinery so they ruled that they, that needs to be considered as well which is a big deal and then they also ruled that um, there was a violation of the national 
the NEPA and CWA, so the Clean Water Act and National Environmental Protection Act. And so basically what that means is that the Army Corps has to go back and do a full and thorough EIS on this project, including the pipeline and all of the associated emissions. And that process will take at least a year for them to complete. So this is a really direct blow to the battleship on this project because they essentially now have no federal permits. And it puts ecology in a very interesting position because here we now have these, this project that has no federal construction permits. And, and on a state level, they're trying to decide on a shorelines permit for a project that doesn't have any federal construction permits. So it's, it's put them in an interesting position. So it'll be, we're very curious to see um, kind of how that plays out over the next week um, as they make that decision on the shorelines permit. And that is something that, you know, um, we'll be watching very closely and we will continue to pursue this project until we are sure that this refinery is not ever gonna happen. Another thing about this refinery is the gas use. It, it requires so much gas um, and there is a somewhat limited supply of gas to this region and there's a lot of concern that the amount of gas this project would require would really inhibit um, the potential for other future economic developments that might require some, some gas use. So um, there's a lot of, you know, environmental, public health and safety, but also economic concerns about this project um, that long term would not create the kind of, you know, number of jobs that we need for that are safe for folks. So um, this is, I know a lot, I'm trying to like <laughs> rush through a, a ton of information. Um, again, folks can, can check out more on our website. But in terms of how we're asking folks to engage right now, we've been, a lot of you are familiar with No Methanol Mondays. Every Monday we've been having that, asking folks to call Governor Inslee's office and to you know sign our petition on our website. Um, we have just a, a limited time left. So every day is No Methanol Monday at this point. Um, any calls you can make to Gover Governor Inslee's office. And we've got some info up on the slide right now. We're recording this so folks can look at this later, but also if people want to take out their phones and maybe take a picture um, just so that they can capture this information. Um, we are trying to just, you know, full court press right now, putting the pressure on um, to make sure they know we're watching. We're expecting them to do the right thing to help us protect what we love um, and, and to make, to have a better vision for our future and to make better better calls than locking us into decades of, of dirty, dangerous energy project, projects. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. We're at a very exciting point in that campaign. And so um, uh, we will have more updates on that very soon, I'm sure. And I know I skipped a lot of stuff trying to condense that. So Dan or Aaron, anything that you guys wanted to, to mention that I might have left out? No, I think that, well, one thing I would just add briefly is um, Kalama sits in this uh, broader context where in the state of Washington, people will be working on a, a fossil fuel rule to really strengthen um, the state's approach on projects like these, including the Tacoma LNG project where the Puyallup tribe has taken a really uh, firm stand and. Uh, Unfortunately, the company has insisted on building that project um, regardless. Um, so these things connect in, in that ecology will be taking comments through 2021 on act the actual framework for how they look at projects like these going forward. So again, that's just a really um, a nice hook for people in Washington where you can have a really big voice in how uh, how to protect communities from the worst of these impacts in 2021. This is uh, this thing is in motion, so it, it can be steered in the right direction. Um, and a lot of a lot of that work, a lot of the good thinking that's already happened, has happened because of great leadership from people. Um, pushing back on these projects um, in Tacoma and Kalama and other places. So, and that comes with great organizing. So thanks to all of you. 
Yeah, it's true, Dan. There have been folks from all across the region who have really stepped up to help support this um, fight to protect Kalama from having harmful development. So it's it's really another testament. You know, if you think back again to that map at the beginning that we looked at, um, it, it's exciting to let, you know, I think a lot of times when we're working on these projects, we get kind of stuck, you know, with our heads down. We're, we're working away and trying to make a difference. But when you pull back and look at a map like that over time, it, it's exciting, you know, and now we've, we're looking at these, you know, of course there will be more to come, but right now that map is looking pretty great in my eyes. Um, so that's because of, of, of people like you all and others who have come together to really um, to stand up for our communities. So um, with that, we can go a little further down river. We have one more project stop that we want to make on our down river tour of fossil fuel projects. Um, and so this one has got a lot going on. So Dan is going to um, give us a, a kind of a, his best overview of all the things that are happening right now in Port Westward. Actually, Gabby, would you mind skipping to the next slide and then we'll step back? Um, so because we've been going for a while, let me just say um, there's a really important public comment period open for this issue right now and what you're looking at on this picture is Port Westward which is this big bend in the river um, 837 acres and kind of sitting bes behind these two industrial sites and off to the and off to sort of the right um, past the dock is 837 acres again of uh, prime farmland and forested wetlands and really valuable um, habitat that is proposed to be rezoned um, to industrial use and so we're talking about something establishing something almost on the scale of like the port of Vancouver um, in this really very sensitive area on the Columbia River where people farm and raise blueberries and mint and um, there is a history here of um, sanding grounds um, for for fishing for salmon and obviously going back to the beginning there is a, a deep history here of uh, uh, tribal people fishing and and using this site so um, this is a very important spot in the Columbia River because of where it bends and it also has a naturally scouring um, kind of deep spot right here so where you see that dock in the image that's uh, kind of carved out naturally by the river. And so they don't necessarily have to dredge that very often in order to get big ships in and out. So it has been used as a port uh, for a long time. Um, and this is very close to, you know, uh, Longview. Um, if you kind of look upstream and you're looking, well, if you look right across the river, um, it is kind of a cliff. Um, just downstream from Longview. If you drive it down Highway 4, um, it's a pretty dramatic spot in the river. Uh, this whole area is a real nexus for fracked gas infrastructure. There's a pipeline that comes from the Washington side and pipeline infrastructure that comes down from Oregon side and they sort of meet here. So Port Westward is kind of this catch-all for all kinds of different fossil fuel projects and it has been for a long time. Uh, back in 2004, it was proposed for a liquefied natural gas import facility um, back when the gas industry was claiming that we would run out of gas in North America and so we had to build all kinds of LNG import facilities. Um, that proposal failed because um, community activists stood uh, firmly with um, local landowners and resisted eminent domain um, and that was a very powerful uh, moment I think um, sort of resisting uh, kind of some bad thinking in terms of how the, um, how kind of a poorly planned economic development should get to use someone else's property. Um, so this gives you a little bit, thank you for stepping back with this slide. Um, this gives you a little bit more of a step back overview. Uh, this is the rezone area. Uh, you'll see that in purple and um, it's and kind of 
around it are kind of tucked in other industrial facilities. So a lot of you are familiar with Global Partners. That is an existing facility uh, built a long time ago as an ethanol refinery, uh, bought by Global Partners and then converted to an oil train terminal for a, a period of time uh, with very little public knowledge or, uh, or scrutiny. Um, they are currently moving renewable diesel and that's um, something that you know, if they stay on that path would be, I think, far more preferable for the community because these trains come all the way up. You know, they come through probably Vancouver, most likely through Portland, and then down you know, through um, all these Columbia County towns. So anything that goes to Port Westward by rail has to basically go through, you know, Scappoose, St. Helens, all those, all those towns right along Highway 30. Um, that rail line you see is the one that goes to Port Westward uh, if you're driving down Highway 30. So you can imagine if an oil train were to derail, they would have a significant impact in one of these communities. Um, so Global Partners, you know, the hope is that they will not switch back to oil. But in 2018, they did seek a, uh, an amendment their agreement with the Port of Columbia County, which allowed them to handle heavier types of oil. So they've kind of taken this step in the not too distant past to uh, indicate that they might be interested in moving oil again. Um, so the community is really watching and trying to get a sense for you know, how much can they trust this company not to go back to oil? How much can they trust them to just move forward with renewable diesel um, and you know, kind of keeping an eye on it? All of that global partner stuff is outside of the rezone area. So they are not encumbered by the rezone. The rezone would be something entirely new. Um, it's new farm, farmland that would be converted to industrial use. And that would be the site of the second proposed methanol refinery. So if you put these two methanol refineries together, the one at Port Westward, the one in Kalama, we're talking about a globally significant amount of methanol and a huge amount of frat gas. Um, you put them to the two together, that amount of frat gas is, you know, on the order of, uh, it's not quite as much as the entire state of Oregon uses, but it's close. Um, just a tremendous amount of energy moving through this region if, if they were both to move forward. Um, and that would require a kind of a replumbing of the whole pipeline system. So Port Westward is really an important spot, not just because of what happens with the river and with the local farmland there, which is really significant land use issues, but also for the whole region, uh, because what kind of radiates outward from Port Westward could really impact uh, people far away, you know, people all the way up. You know, if they decide to try to expand the pipeline up the I-5, um, or they, you know, there's long been a proposal to connect a pipeline between Malala and Madras, sort of up, or sort of like Stanfield area up and over the Clackamas River, um, you know, an area that just burned pretty dramatically. Um, the connections, obviously, in these fossil fuel issues are um, really kind of, can be mind numbing, but I think what brings us back over and over um, is that these communities are communicating with each other and learning from one another. So one thing that really inspired me about Port Westward um, was seeing how the Cowlitz County community and the Columbia County community shared stories and supported each other over and over and over. Um, they have, you know, obviously they look at each other across the river and, you know, they would go to each other's hearings and the Kalama crew, as we call them, um, the folks who put together um, no methanol 360 and then envision columbia county they have so much in common and so many common issues um, they would uh, i've just seen over and over this uh crossover of expertise and what what i want to end on here with port westward is just an acknowledgement that so much of the work we do if if i sound like i know anything it's by and large because i've learned it from someone out there you know, 
for real. Like there are folks like Chris Turner, who's passed away now in Kalama, um, or, you know, just geniuses down in Columbia County, there's too many to name, um, who have been at this for a long time, kind of tending to these critical spots in the river that are always targeted for fossil fuel developments. And through that activism, they have had a really outsized impact on the overall, you know, potential pollution that we'll see in the Columbia, in the climate, or in even in far, far away communities where these fossil fuels move. Um, so Port Westward um, remains a very important place for us to, to continue to watch and weigh in. Um, there's a very large renewable diesel refinery proposed um, at Port Westward that, again, that is also outside of the rezone area. And I just want to mention that um, you can do your own research on that. It's called Next Energy. It's principal spokesperson with Lou Sumas. You can look him up. Um, and uh, I think the next steps here for Port Westward will be, again, commenting to the county on this question of whether industrializing this area would be compatible with the adjacent farmland, but also um, looking forward to any opportunities to, to weigh in with state agencies, but also um, whatever we can do just on a more fundamental level to make sure that those folks downriver feel our support um, wherever we are. And, you know, that the information keeps flowing both ways and we all learn from each other. So, um, yeah, thanks, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, this this area is such an interesting area, right? Because it's pretty pretty um, coveted in terms of its deep water access and its access to the ocean. And it's also, you know, we have the Columbia River Estuary, which is, you know, home to some of the most critical salmon habitats and runs in this region. And um, this this fight for Port Westport is right in the heart of that fight as well for to protect the estuary. So you know, everything that, like Port Westward is just right there. Everything that comes out of Port Westward is going directly into the estuary. That's all there is to it. And so these are really critical areas that are, are important for us to protect, you know, locally, regionally. And I think what you were saying about these different communities coming together is, is so true. I mean, like so much of our work now is centered in coalition work. Um, and it's so important because we, you know, there's so much information and it can be stressful and we can't be expected to know all of the pieces of information to be able to have these coalitions and community members and volunteers to work with so we can each bring our tidbits of information together to get a better picture of the, the whole, um, the whole that, that's there is really valuable. So, you know, we really couldn't do this work without that coalition and partnering and tribal and community support that happens all the time. Um, and, you know, the rezone, I just want to reemphasize that, you know, the, they want to rezone over 800 acres of really important, you know, there's, there's mint farms, there's blueberry farms, there's cattle being raised, there's people who live there, it's in its critical habitat. And it's in this very sensitive area water-wise, right? And Dan knows more about this than I do, but my understanding of this is that it's a diked area. It's kind of like in a bowl. And um, when there's a, an influx of water, there's pumps. There's a pump system to pump that water out uh, into the slough so it can go back into the river. And this, this rezone, you know, it's considering 2,000 feet out from the boundary and their solution, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, their solution for an incident, an accident or a spill or something, is to just shut off the pumps. Well, if that happens in the midst of a, a high water situation, which happens a lot in our region, you're essentially flooding that area, not only flooding that area, but flooding it with toxic materials, right? So this is, this is really serious, um, and, and no rezone equals no twin methanol refinery here. So this is a really important issue. And I'm going to have Dan 
make sure I'm getting that right. But also, I just want to remind people that the deadline for comments got extended. It's January 27th. And so it's really important for folks to, to put in their comments about why we want to protect this area and, and protect that farmland and, and habitat and, and all of, of those people's homes from, from a disaster. So did I get that right, Dan? Am I missing, missing anything there? Yeah, you said a couple of things that I think are right on the mark. One is um, that whole farm spot down there is very sensitive and um, our good friend and colleague Jasmine uh, Zimmer Stuckey has been working with 1000 Friends of Oregon and, and kind of gathering um, these stories and this information to help demonstrate how the idea of a massive potential polluting refinery could really impact, you know, these neighboring areas that rely on clean water to grow things like organic crops. You know, it's just very, it's very tangible. Um, the other thing I would say is um, that this area in particular has kind of seen this uh, coalition, like, it's been like the center of so many coalitions in, in some ways forming over and over. Um, not the center, but it's been a center, I guess I would say. Um, and I would just want to appreciate the work that many of our partner organizations do out there um, who lead and collaborate um, in the Stand Up to Oil Coalition and in the Power Pass Frack Gas Coalition um, because it's both more rewarding and effective to work together, but also um, it takes a lot of work to understand how these interconnections work. So thank you for saying that as well, Kate. Anything else that, Aaron, you have anything to add on Port Westward? All right, so we, I know we just unloaded a, a lot of information on everyone um, and we will be available to answer questions. You know, you can email us. Um, we all have our individual emails. You can find them on our ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org website under our staff page. Here is some contact info for you as well to, you can take a photo of it, but a lot of you can just go to the website, you know, look us up individually or write a, a, your questions to info at ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org um, because, you know, we don't want to leave anybody hanging, but also um, we do have about 10 minutes to, to if anybody does have any pressing questions that they wanted to have answered um, right now might might be in the process of kind of digesting. I know some questions have been answered already in the chat and folks might be just kind of thinking if you're anything like me, you're thinking I might rewatch this again and then I'll have my questions. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's um, it's just really exciting to see all this work that's being done together. Um, when I first kind of got involved in this movement, it felt a lot more siloed and it's just beautiful to see these like blooming coalitions happening and working in collaboration and that's the way we're getting it done. And it's it's really quite beautiful to, to, to be a part of that with all of you. So, um, we definitely appreciate you, um, your interest and dedication to all of these issues for sure. Um, I see there is um, a little comment about the status of Jordan Cove, which is a great question. Um, it's not specifically on our downriver tour, but I think we could um, take a minute maybe. Uh, Dan, do you have any um, updates on the status of Jordan Cove? I know there's been some some good good news down there recently with some permits that were maybe um yeah you know again, more than I do. yeah just an amazing amount of work that's happened um at the local level on land use issues you know where um local uh advocates have continued to push back on um, this uh jordan cove energy project which would really reshape Coos Bay and then involve a huge pipeline going across communities all along Southwest Oregon. Um, so they've won several significant land, local land use cases recently. Um, that's just amazing. I mean, considering after 15 years, they're still 
able to demonstrate that this project is inconsistent with the Coos County and, and various other local land use ordinances. I mean, that's just, um, there, I mean, there have been these corporate attorneys trying to squeeze this project into those ordinances for over 15 years now. And it's um, this coalition of um, local experts and with some outside legal help um, and Tanya Morrow is an incredible job. Um, that's, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. So that's on Jordan Cove at the local level, at the state level, what's really significant is the state has actually denied most of the significant permits for this project or refused to issue them. Um, that comes as a result of incredible community uh, organizing and positive pressure um, where people really um, encouraged the governor to stand up for uh, communities that would be negative impact, negatively impacted by the pipeline, by the terminal, by kind of the huge amount of dredging in Coos Bay. Looking ahead, um, they have a FERC certificate that is being litigated at the federal level. Um, FERC may try to um, override or, you know, obviate in some way state decisions, but fundamentally the state of Oregon still owns the bed and banks of many of these rivers and Coos Bay. So it's, it's really significant um, that Oregon is taking such a firm stand because they have many, many legal tools available to them to hold their ground if they so choose um, against uh, what would be one of the most destructive projects Oregon has ever seen um, in terms of uh, dredging and cutting um, across Southwest Oregon. Um, and for the tribal communities in, um, in Klamath and all the way over to the coast, it's, it's been remarkable to watch uh, people come together and uh, the effort that has gone into informing this process has just been so significant for 15 plus years. Um, I just can't say enough from someone who, you know, I lived down there for a little while, but then obviously I've moved back to Northern Oregon. And, um, it's a big challenge to track a project on this scale for this long. That was a long answer to a really simple question, but yeah, uh, Jordan Cove is hard to encapsulate. The next step on Jordan Cove, by the way, um, one thing that people will be able to engage on there is a proposed, they're calling the really the Coos Bay Mega Dredge um, project of the Port of Coos Bay to do um, something like 18 million cubic yards of dredging, um, just to really carve, to kind of gut Coos Bay almost like a fish, you know, just really carve it out um, that estuary, and that would allow much larger tankers to move in and out. And so that comment may come forward later in 2021 and there's great local leaders from Coos Bay I think who are um, going to know much more than I will about uh, how to comment effectively on that. Thank you Dan that also just thinking about other things that are going well uh, we we didn't put this on our list because it's not something we're actively opposing um, but we had some really great progress in Vancouver this was largely due to like again on the backs of the Vancouver activists who have been just very persistent about pushing for climate policy and there is now a city ordinance in the city of Vancouver that's banning um, bulk fossil fuels which is just huge um, huge success and they're working on a more thorough protective climate policy for the city. So just wanted to mention that as well between, you know, Portland's making a lot of uh, progress with their protective actions and Vancouver and some other cities in the region. And I think, again, like we're in this very critical spot geographically to be able to, you know, kind of 
operate as a cork to a lot of these fossil fuel export projects. And I, I think um, that, you know, just want to highlight how important it is to be pushing for local city and county ordinances and policies to be put in place that give us some backing when we want to kind of stop these projects and, you know, state level too as well, but starting local and building up and really kind of building protective policies for community, I think is so important when, you know, we're faced with these things that gives us more ability to, to, you know, build resilience and choose other um, safer, healthier options for, for energy sources and things like that. Um, also, Jean's asking um, for Port Westward, who has the authority to rezone? Now, I know we're appealing to the county commissioners, right? But there's also the LUBA issue to somebody uh, that, sorry, the Land Use Board of Appeals um, has to make sure it's compatible. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, uh, so the Port of Columbia County is asking the county commission to convert the land, to rezone it from farmland to industrial. Um, and so it's a county commission decision. Um, if let's say they denied that rezone request, then Port of Columbia County could appeal that denial to the Land Use Board of Appeals. Uh, so that's how that system works. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little confusing to try and figure out who's in charge of what. Um, I also want to just highlight a question I see in the chat um, about the concern for workers, um, you know, when they're dealing with the radioactive fracking waste, um, both the the filter bags, uh, the filter socks, um, as well as like, I just want to like, I'm going to pass this to Dan, but, you know, a lot of times because of the inconsistent and not very protective regulations from state to state, a lot of times workers who are exposed to these materials are unaware that they're being exposed to radioactive materials. So, you know, for example, you might have a tanker truck that was hauling fracking waste from one place to another, and then it's empty and you got like these kind of dredges in the bottom, which are actually condensed radioactive material, but they, maybe the worker isn't told that. So in they climb without their protective gear um, and they're being exposed to this like very harmful substance. So. Um, there's, there's, that's just one thing that comes to mind for me. Additionally, there's all these, like I said, you know, using fracking wastewater as de-icer and, you know, having different kind of leeway for this type of waste is really problematic. Um, but in terms specifically of the filter socks, um, Dan, you could maybe have something to add about how that's like particularly concentrated. Yeah, the filter socks, I think, were interesting. There was a great presentation from, um, some folks with Physicians for Social Responsibility on the East Coast. Uh, they were dealing with this in Pennsylvania. And I learned quite a bit about um, why the filter socks might kind of, you might get preferentially certain radionuclides over others. Um, and so again, it's like this really wild thing to think about fracking. And you, so you think about toxic chemicals and you think about methane and greenhouse gas emissions, but then you have this radioactive component and then within that, um, you know, the filters will grab certain, maybe say heavier radionuclides like that are um, not so much heavier, but uh, it's a question of whether they're soluble or mobile and whether they stick to the kind of uh, clays or, or gravels that might get stuck in a filter versus the things that'll just flow with water and would flush through a filter. Um, so those things that would be stuck to that material would be more likely caught in the filters. And in this case, um, it looks like some of that stuff was uh, uranium. And that's why we may have seen that uranium release more slowly through the Arlington landfill and then show up in the leachate. You know, it was kind of stuck in the filters for a while, but then over time, you know, water percolates through. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, dramatic problem for all involved. Potentially, the exposure levels um, can be really low. Um, and so that's, that's really the question is like, how much are you getting exposed to? And so I don't wanna like give people the sense that this is like, you know, you're standing next to Hanford's high level waste. It's, it's not that level stuff, it's low level waste. But you definitely don't wanna drink water that has 358 picocuries per liter of uranium in it. So there's 
you know, there's definitely a problem with what's going on with this radioactive fracking waste. And um, I think it's, I think it's a, a complicated issue that would be expensive to deal with if the oil and gas industry weren't just, you know, shoving it out the door, you know, in ways that were um, sometimes very irresponsible. And that's what we saw in Arlington. It was just, they just got dumped on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. I know we're at time, but I, if, if Dan and Aaron, if you're okay with it, I want to just maybe end with one more question and then um, we can wrap up. So I just wanted, I saw this question from John about the air at the Zenith terminal, which really stinks. And are these emissions legal under their old permit? And that's a great question, John, because we've been talking about this stinky air. And um, I do know that, you, you know, anyone who notices the stinky air coming from Zenith is entitled to file a nuisance complaint um, about that odor because it, they're not really allowed to stink up the whole place. It's a tricky area though because there are so many different operations happening simultaneously. It can be kind of tricky to untangle where the smell is coming from. Um, but yeah, so Aaron, maybe you have feedback on, on the um, permits and how they're kind of getting away with that. Yeah, so what we've been told from DEQ is that since it was operating previously as an asphalt refinery, that it actually had greater emissions back when it was an asphalt refinery than it does now. So DEQ's response so far has just been like, oh, it's covered under the existing permit. Um, but I, but you know, they're obviously their operations have changed. I think that they've changed their SIC codes too. Um, which does affect the amount of emissions that they should be allowed to have for these particular types of operations. Um, but, I, you know, since they've been operating under this permit that's been expired for so long, my impression from my conversations with DEQ is that Zenith has been kind of updating them piecemeal. Like, oh, now we're doing this, and now we're doing this. And so I really have no idea <laughs> what DEQ's sense of Zenith's operation is at this point. Um, and I'd be really curious to see what the draft air permit looks like when it comes out. Um, but that's definitely something that we are keeping an eye on and concerned about and tracking. Um, so hopefully some of those questions will be answered when the draft permit comes out. There's also a question that may have gotten buried a little bit back about where the oil is going that Zenith brings through. Um, from what we can tell tracking it, um, and there's an app where you can track these tanker ships, and we can see that they're going up to refineries in Washington and then some of them down in California. So they basically, they go down the river and then they either hang a right or hang a left, but they're not that oil is not being used for the regional market. It's purely passing through Portland. It does not need to be here. Um, and then one other thing to note too about Zenith's location is that whole industrial area down there in the Northwest Industrial Zone, it's a liquefaction zone. It's a well-documented, well-studied liquefaction zone, which basically means that when we have this giant Cascadia earthquake that we're all waiting for, that area is all just gonna like settle down like quicksand. And so, you know, we don't need giant tanks full of crude oil down there um, on top of everything else that's down in that area. So just one more risky thing about Zenith's facility. That's a great point, Erin. It's a, it's a very fragile area and, and very vulnerable for her incident should the earth decide to give us a shake. Um, so um, with that, we're a little bit over time. So we're going to um, switch gears and kind of wrap up. I, if you had some questions and you didn't get your question answered, please feel free to reach out to us. We're going to switch to a slide um, that has our, there it is, our contact info. Um, you can find a lot more information about all of these different projects at ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org. Um, each of us has our own email. You can reach out to us as well. Um, and I just want to give, you know, also a huge thank you to our coalitions and our coalition partners, Power Pass Frack Gas, Santa to Oil, No Methanol 360, Envision, you know, there's LCSC, there's too many to, to name, um, but um, our work with community, our work with tribal nations, our work with with all of you has just really 
been the thing that makes this possible. So thank you to all of you. You're amazing. And we, we are looking forward to like, you know, continued good work and our collaborations in the future. Um, thanks for your interest in these projects. Thank you to Aaron and Dan for being here and to Gabby for keeping us so on track with the, the tech and everything. Um, and thank you to all of you for sticking it out on a Thursday evening to learn about um, where we're at with all this stuff. So we're going to sign off um, and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for your moderating, Kate.